I think when Noah was about, I, I never asked Noah if I could tell this story, but when Noah was like uh, eight, nine years old, we were playing out in the snow in, in our front yard up in um, Devil's Lake, North Dakota. That's where we lived before we eventually moved to China and then to Boulder. So this was, yeah, he was seven, eight years old, and we were throwing snowballs at each other. And Noah was easily maybe from me to like the farthest place in our backyard you can go. So maybe that's 50, 70 feet, something like that from me to the rocks. And I remember I had a snowball in my hand and I said, Noah, stay still. I'm going to peg you between your teeth. <laughs> now, I, I'm, I'm not an athlete. And so I actually had, I had very little faith that I could, I, could, I could throw a snowball that far uh, and that far accurately and that far with laser sharp focus accuracy. I, I really had no faith whatsoever. So he stood still like this. I remember his stance. It was like this and he smiled and I, I threw this snowball and it's like instantly slow motion because instantly I could tell like, wow, that's, that's actually going pretty good. <laughs> And, and then it's, it's getting closer and closer to his head. And I think, wow, he, he's going to move. He's, he's going to move in a second. But he, he didn't move. <laughs> <laughs> and it nailed him right between, right on his forehead, right between his eyes. Just boom. And the snow just like exploded. And I think there was a moment in time that froze and everything was quiet. But then all of a sudden, he, he burst out into tears and, and crying, <laughs> ran toward the house. And I'm like, no. <laughs> Don't tell your mother. <laughs> but he, he got in, told his mom. And I was like, oh my, you know, what do I do? And so that night, it gets worse. Um, <laughs> Patty is putting Noah to bed. Patty says, why didn't you move Noah? Okay, here's the answer. Because I trusted daddy. <laughs> so, literally, like the worst moment, like, like the funniest moment, like the worst moment. But um, I'm, I'm very grateful that, okay, two things. Noah, number one, he, he trusted me again. But number two, I'm grateful that he got even with me the next year. Okay, he did get he did give it, get even with the next year. It wasn't really fair. I think I think you know I had like 50, 70 feet, whatever it was, but he was in point blank range, and he threw he threw an ice ball at me the next year into my ear, and it it even drew a little bit of blood. So, but <laughs> so yeah, it's fair. So you know the score has been settled. But, you know, I, I start with that story because we're, we're talking this morning about what it means to have childlike faith. And the reason we're asking that question is because um, we, we are going through our values at Belay. We haven't done that in the four years that we've been here, but it seemed like time. And maybe it's, you know, it's, it's unusual. It's a Christmas season. And so I chose a value that I thought, yeah, that goes along very well um, with Christmas. And, and maybe, maybe a preliminary answer to what does it mean to have childlike faith that means maybe even when our faith is challenged, you know, like my son's was when I nailed him between the eyes with a, with a snowball, is that we just keep trusting. You know, there's something so innocent and pure about childlike faith. And uh, this is what we are called to possess. And uh, maybe it's a good time at Christmas to even think about that. We often think of Christmas as a time for children. Our trees are surrounded with presents. But childlike faith is something that we should never grow out of, that we would always possess. So I think I have my dad reading uh, Luke chapter 18. Where's he at? There he is. Okay, read it nice and loud, Dad. Um, Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Okay, let's pray. So Lord, we thank you that, um, we thank you for this command. You didn't command us to become the smartest in the world. Um, you didn't command us to become 
just extraordinarily educated where we might, you know, just be one of the smartest people there is. You told us to have childlike faith, to become like a child. That's something that each one of us, we can do that. We can humble ourselves and possess that childlike faith. And so we pray right now just for the grace to do that. You would help us to become like children, to um, have faith, Lord, like a child. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to give uh, just four answers to this question. What does it mean to have childlike faith? And the first answer I want to share is that we truly believe that nothing is impossible. We truly believe that with God, nothing is impossible. So since my dad is here, I thought I would pick a couple of stories. When I was young, he had a couple of magic tricks that got me every single time. Okay. Every time I was like stunned. One of them was just the simple coin trick, right? And so you have a coin in this hand and you just grab it with this hand, right? Like he did. And then he would, you know, whoa, the coin's not my hand. And I would like, wow, where did it go? And then he would reach up and then he would pull out, you know, the quarter out of my ear. And every time it's like, how did you do that? Right. And another one that he did that I don't know that I've ever, you know, encountered anybody else that has done this, but he would walk up and he would grab my nose, okay? And then he would put his thumb between his fingers and he would say, look at that, I got your nose. And I was convinced that he was holding my nose as a little kid. And I was terrified, like, you know, oh, what am I gonna do without a nose? And then he would put it back, you know? And I was, I was convinced that he could do this. And it's that kind of simple, simple faith that our Father can do anything, that our Father can do anything is a childlike faith that I believe that we are called to possess, that we just simply believe that He can do anything. And I think in the context of this passage, um, did we read this yet? Or I just skipped right by it. I just skipped right by it, didn't I? Who has number six? Go ahead. Uh, then Jesus said to His disciples, truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And so, you know, I love that. As we think about the fact that God can do anything, if it's in the will of God, God can do it. Nothing can stand in his way. And the most important thing for us to realize about that truth is that the anything that he can do is save each and, one of, each, each and every one of us, right? No, no, not, not one of us is outside the saving grace of Jesus. There's nobody in Boulder that is outside the saving grace of Jesus. So he can, he can do anything. And I think, you know, when I think about our faith, my family, um, we had to really grab a hold of this truth that God can do anything before we came to Boulder because there was all these things that seemed impossible. It seemed impossible to find a place to live here. Um, it seemed impossible to um, think about starting a church in a place like Boulder. And what I want to do right now is I want to read to you um, this value statement right off our website, all right? So if you were to go to belay.church, you would find this statement. I'm going to read it. It's on the screen as well. It says, with God, all things are possible. Many have said that establishing a church in Boulder is impossible. It's too expensive. People aren't interested. Plenty of good people have tried and failed. All of that has been said to us at different times. And while the intentions of those making the comments are good, we choose to move forward in childlike faith, believing that God desires to establish not only Belay, but also many other life-giving churches in Boulder and beyond. Jesus said, once said something that reframes everything. With God, all things are possible. Matthew 19, 26. For us, all things includes belay. It also includes the mountains of impossibility that each of us face as we choose to live a missional lifestyle in our various spheres of influence. Whatever hindrance we face as we endeavor to build his kingdom, we face it with childlike faith, remembering the words of Jesus. With man, this is impossible, with, but with God, all things are possible. Matthew 19, 26. So what does it mean to have childlike faith? I think the first answer is that we believe that nothing is impossible with God. All right, nothing is impossible. Number two is that we remain continually humble. 
This is the car that my family owned when I was growing up. How many, how many had a car kind of like that? Anybody else? Okay, Terrell had one. Okay, Gavin, good. Yeah, Patty did. Patty actually drove one like this, right? It's my car. You had a car like this. <laughs> I bought it. <laughs> so, now, yeah, I don't know what year that would have been. Probably late 70s. I, I just grabbed this from the internet, but we, had, we probably had a 1979, 80, something like that. Um, so I'm the youngest of three kids, so I'll give you a couple of guesses as to where I got to sit in this beauty. In the back, sitting backwards. In, in the back, sitting backwards, yes. I and didn't own one, but I had the pleasure of living next to someone who did, and they had a very steep driveway, and I would go, woo! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think our, like our wealthy neighbors down the street, they had a station wagon, but they actually had a rear-facing seat in the back. That was for the cool kids. But mine, mine was just an empty, you know, trunk space, right? <laughs> so... Like where you, put the, where you put your spare tire, where you put the groceries, where you put the pets, that's where I got to sit, is, that, is way in the back. Or I got to sit sometimes in that middle seat in the back where you have the hump, you know, so your, 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 your knees are up by your chin. Um, yeah, so that's, that's where um, I got to enjoy sitting as a kid. And, but, you know, that's, that's, that's just kind of how it is as a kid. We're, we're put in um, humble situations. We're put in these humble spots. And uh, we can't wait to grow out of that spot. We can't wait until we're old enough one day that we will be able to have the steering wheel in our hands. Can I hear an amen from Duncan and Adrian and Samuel? Amen, right? <laughs> that you, um, you can't wait for somebody else to take their turn in the back seat, the seat of humility, okay? Um, actually, there was one plus to sitting in the back. The very back had carpet, and the middle seat was vinyl. And on a summer day, you could cook an egg on the vinyl seats up in northern Montana. So I had at least had a little carpeting in the back. Um, but we can't wait for somebody else to take their turn. And as the disciples were following Jesus, they were often put in places of humility, how did that look for the disciples? How, was the, how were they humbled by following Jesus? What was some of their reality? What, what comes to mind? Meg. They left everything, like they left their careers and fishing to go follow Jesus, not knowing if they'd be provided for. That's right. They left everything, not knowing if they're going to be provided for. Yep. What else? Trent. The, the storms that Jesus calmed and the walking on water. Yeah. Okay. How did that humble the disciples? It was humbling because look at his almighty power that he could have this man like how sure okay how could he, whoa like there's yeah something going on. yeah that's true that's good what else comes to mind how are they he confounded the wise with, with the parables of children yeah yeah okay make you wise because it's simple that's good so I, th I think of other things too. Maybe, maybe the things that aren't, that maybe we have to use our imag imagination about. Jesus said that he had no place to lay his head. So where do you think the disciples slept? They probably slept on the ground, right? They probably slept on the ground along with Jesus. Jesus says, the son of man has no place to lay his head. And so the disciples, like Meg says, leave everything. And they get to witness the miracles. But when they go home at night, it's not home. It's a pasture where they're laying on the ground, perhaps. And when Jesus said, it's time to eat, Guess who was doing the serving? The disciples, right? So they're in these places really of humility. They're following this great teacher that can do anything, but yet they're placed in this position where they're serving. And the disciples, I think, are thinking, I wonder when we get to grow out of this. And they asked some questions, and we're going to look at one of the questions they asked. Matthew 18, 1 to 5, it says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and they asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And the disciples, they asked other questions like that. They said, which one of us gets to sit next to you in the kingdom of heaven and glory, right? Which one of us is actually the greatest of the 12? Who's the best, right? This kind of thing was on their mind. The disciples are thinking, when do we get to have the steering wheel? When do we get to be the ones that are out front? And Jesus continues, he said, then he, verse 2, so they just asked the question, who's the greatest? Verse 2 says, he called a little child to them and placed the child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name 
welcomes me. So what does it mean to have childlike faith? I think another answer to this question is, is that we're willing to take the back seat as followers of Jesus. We're willing to serve. We're willing to be in this, this humble place. All right. And, I, it's, and it's not popular view of Christianity, right? The popular view of Christianity is that, um, well, you just get a higher and bigger and better platform, right? To be on, but Jesus calls us to be like little children. So that's one side of the coin, but there is another side to this coin of of this, you know, growing in humility. Um, If we're going to have childlike faith, here's the third answer, is that we need to keep on growing. We need to keep on growing. This is what a child does. Have you noticed, especially at Christmas time, it'll be a year since you've seen maybe a, a, a younger part of your family, maybe a nephew, maybe a cousin, maybe a niece, and they've grown like a foot. Or they've grown a foot and a half, like, what in the world? You know, when we find ourselves as we grow older saying things like, I remember you when you were just, <laughs> and it happened so fast, right? And I remember that, I remember as Samuel started to catch up with me in height, and, and then he began to pass me in height, and then he did go past me. And I remember Samuel in particular, he would feel almost like, bad you know he would he would like deny that he was getting taller than his dad (laughs) and I kind of played along with it you know maybe and maybe he played like that because I kind of played like I was sad that our baby was growing up and getting taller than me but the reality is I I I love watching my kids grow and if you're a parent in here you love watching your kids grow right and yeah I miss I miss the littles I miss the tiny versions of them right but I love watching them grow And so listen to what it says in the Christmas story. This is number, who's got reading number seven? Luke chapter two, right here. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. So isn't it amazing that even Jesus grew? Jesus grew and it's, it's, it's weird to think about it. He became strong. He was filled with wisdom. The grace of God was upon him. Jesus. Yeah, Trent. Uh, when we were, t- we were talking about uh, examples of being humbled in the Bible, and it occurred to me like when uh, Peter denies uh, yeah. Jesus. Yeah, that was humbling. Before the cock crows. And then right. It like shows like, who are we to like dispute God's word? Like he told him that was going to happen. And he's like, no, no, no. And then sure. Jesus comes back and you like, you know, he learns from that experience. Yeah. Know? And then Peter grew, yeah. right? Peter grew. He, he, he had a humbling point yeah. where he weeped, wept, and, uh, and then he stood up yeah, after the resurrection, after the, after the falling of the Holy Spirit, and the giving of the Holy Spirit, and he preached to, and 3,000 came to the Lord. So yeah, he, he grew as well. Um, one of the stories I, I love um, that I think illustrates this idea that we keep on growing, um, it, and it, it's a story of Nathaniel, and I think you've got number eight, right? Could you read that for us, John 1? When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. I've always liked that story because I think in Nathaniel's mind, like he had seen the best thing that he had ever seen. Jesus walks up and Jesus knows him. And he's like, how in the world do you know me? And Jesus says, well, I saw you while you were underneath the fig tree before we even came together. And Nathaniel's like, that's amazing. You're the Messiah. And Jesus says, you know, in a sense, he's like, you like that? <laughs> It's going to get a lot better, right? It's, it's it, following me. It's just going to get better and better and better. And, and this is part of our growth that we, as we grow, our, our faith is not meant to reach a certain stage and then we just stop growing. If we're going to, if we're to be like little children, little children keep on growing, right? A, a child is not content to be just as tall as his father, at least my boys were not content, or to be just as tall as their father. They want to be taller. They want, they want to grow past. 
And that's what it means to be a child. We're not, we don't, we don't, it's like, oh, I'm good here, you know. No, they just, they, they keep on growing. And following Jesus, we keep on growing. Sure, Jesus has done something amazing for you in the past. And I'd like you to picture Jesus coming to you and say, you like that? It's even going to get better. There's greater things coming in the future, right? So believe God, continue to believe God for what only God can do. Continue to believe God for miracles. He saved you, great, there's more, right? He continues to lead you, great, but there's more. He provides for you, awesome, but there's more, right? We keep on growing in our faith. We keep on expanding in our knowledge of him. Okay, and I have just one more answer to the question. We're, at, we're looking at the question, what does it mean to have childlike faith? And here's the last one that I, I tacked on really at the end. You know, you know me, I normally do three, but I tacked on one more. Um, it's that we never stop having fun. What does it mean to like have childlike faith? It means that we never stop having fun. You see, kids are experts at having fun, right? You can take every toy from a kid and say, you can't have these and they're going to find something to have fun with. And uh, it's just the way it is, right? Um, when I was, so I have one memory of one of the funniest things that I remember ever happening between my dad and my brother. Um, my dad ran a Woolworth store. Um, you guys don't know what a Woolworth is. If you're Gen Z, it's okay. Think of Walmart or Kmart, but like smaller and um, yeah. And it was like every town in America had a Woolworth store back in the 70s and 80s. And uh, we were sitting at the lunch counter. So in the, in my, my dad's store had a little cafe in it. Um, it had like house products and automobile products and all that, but it also had a little cafe. And so we were sitting at the cafe in this booth and uh, my, brother, my dad was right across from me. My brother was over here and I'm sitting over here and I don't know how old I was, maybe 10. And my dad looked at me and he says, you've got something in your mouth. And I was like, what? He goes, yeah, there's, a little, there's something in your mouth. He says, open your mouth. And so I opened my mouth and I close my eyes, and all of a sudden, I reach in, and there was a crumpled up piece of paper in my mouth. Like it was, it was the, it was the straw wrapper. It was a straw wrapper from, from a straw, and I pulled it out, and I was absolutely stunned. Like how was that in my mouth, and I didn't know it. But, but, but what I didn't know is that when I opened my mouth, my dad perfectly threw, <laughs> perfectly threw a straw wrapper into my mouth. And so it didn't touch my lips, it just went right into my, right into my mouth. And so for me, I was like, I was stunned. Like, how? How did this get here? And it's dry. Why is it dry? <laughs> right? So then, so then, of course, my dad and my, and my brother, you know, to start laughing. And then they, they, they clued me in, thankfully. They actually clued me in how, what had happened. Of course, I started laughing. But here's my takeaway, is that that moment, that moment when I, when I reached in and we started laughing, it's locked in my memory. I can picture it just like it was yesterday. Everything is frozen in my mind. And it's because there's something about joy. There's something about laughter. There's something about fun that actually locks things in to our memory. And uh, I was actually listening to a message the other day and I heard them quote, this lady that I'm going to quote, her name was Dr. Karen Purvis. Um, she is, I guess, do you know who she is? Yes. See, I don't even know who she was. I guess she's passed away now, yeah. um, a few years ago. Uh, she, she was uh, considered to be an expert with child development and worked in Fort Worth, Texas at Texas Christian University. And uh, this is pulled from an interview. So it's going to be spoken language, but I want to read her exact words. It says, we know this, we know from research is that it takes 400 repetitions of an act or a, or a learning skill 400 times to get one new synapse up in your brain. Or would you like to know an option? There's an option. 12 repetitions with joy and laughter and you get a synapse because there's a release of the chemical dopamine when you laugh, when you're experiencing joy. So she says 400 times repeating something so you learn it. But if you're laughing and you're having fun, and you're enjoying it, it's locked in with just 12 repetitions. So according to her, that's correct. We don't, in fact, I, I researched on the internet, like where did she get that? I don't know, it could be an old study, but we just know from anecdotal evidence. I know from my own experience that that memory of probably 40 years ago of sitting at a lunch counter and a piece of paper popped in my mouth, boom, it's locked in, 
right? Because joy and fun and laughter have that. And so what do you think it can do for our faith? Do you think it's a good thing for us to grow kind of old and sour when it comes to our faith? Or what do you think joy and laughter can do for our walk with Jesus? Do you, can, do you think it could lock in the lessons that Jesus wants us to learn? Absolutely, right? And I think if, if, if we could read, if we could really read and understand the culture and the language of 2,000 years ago Greek, we would be laughing even more when we read the Bible than we do. Um, have, has anybody ever kind of smirked when you've read the Gospels? You know, anything Jesus? Jesus says some funny things, and I do think we're missing probably a lot. But I think even when he said something like, you know, why are you trying to remove a speck from your neighbor's eye when there's a plank in your own eye, right? I think, I think things like this made people laugh. And you can just go through the Gospels. There's some, there's some funny stuff, you know, and I love it. And I think Jesus knew we'd lock it in. So I'm going to close with this. I want to read a psalm as we close out. Um, in the book of Psalms, there's 150 psalms. But there's a smaller collection of psalms from 120 to 134. And actually, Samuel brought this up just a couple days ago. Uh, what is Psalm 120 to 134 called, Samuel? Do you remember? Um, the Song of Ascent. Yep. So 120 to 134, there's a collection of psalms called the Psalms of Ascent. And these were psalms that the, the, you know, the, the Jewish pilgrims would sing as they made their way to Jerusalem. Um, and it would be an ascent. They were going uphill to go to Jerusalem. And they would, they would sing these songs. They would recite these as they were going. Now, some have looked at these psalms and said, well, they're not only an ascent physically speaking, but some have said these psalms can also describe drawing closer spiritually to God. In fact, if you know of the message translation, it was written by a guy named Eugene Peterson. Eugene has written like 30 some books. Um, he's passed away now. He wrote a book called um, A Long Direction, a, a Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And the whole book is based around the Psalm of Ascents, where, where it's, it's, it's his conviction, or it was his conviction, that these psalms are like meant to teach us how to draw closer to God. And I think he's got a really good point. And so his practice in the later years of his life is that he would recite one of these psalms every morning for his personal devotions. Well, I want to read just one of those psalms. It's uh, Psalm 126. I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. It says, it's titled, A Song for Pilgrims Ascending to Jerusalem. When the Lord brought back his exiles to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. We were filled with laughter. Isn't that something? They're reciting this. They're singing these words. We were filled with laughter. We sang for joy. And the nation said, what amazing things the Lord has done for them. Yes, the Lord has done amazing things for us. What joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord. As streams renew the desert, those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed, but they sing as they return with the harvest. You see, I think laughter, joy, fun is meant to characterize our walk with Jesus. You know, getting serious about our faith does not mean we have to get more serious, right? Getting serious about our walk with Jesus does not mean we have to get all serious. Getting serious about our walk with Jesus I think should make us more fun, make us more enjoyable to be around. And that's, that's kind of an exception to the rule. It seems like the more Christian somebody gets, the more unpleasant they can be to be around, right? <laughs> Shouldn't be that way. What were you going to say, Terrell? Probably should maybe and learn to, learn to let go of some stuff that we hang on to. Mm -hmm. That's good, Terrell. joyful in the Lord. Amen. Yeah, that's right. So let me wrap it up and then we'll pray. So what does it mean to have childlike faith? Just to review. Number one, we truly believe nothing is impossible. That, like I said, has never been a conviction of mine to the extent that it has as us moving to Colorado. We moved to China with maybe a lot of faith. We moved to Boulder with more faith than I think we had in us. Jesus had to give us the faith to do this, right? So we have to believe that nothing is impossible with God. Number two, uh, we remain humble. We, we don't grow out of this place of being a servant like Jesus was. Jesus said, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life. 
we don't get to grow out of this. I'm sorry, right? Um, we, we don't get to go up some totem pole or we have more power and more prestige. No, we, we actually grow down as, as, we, as we grow up in our relationship with Jesus, okay? Number three, we keep, we keep on growing, right? We keep, we keep believing like a child that it's going to get better, right? We, we keep on believing, yeah, we're going to keep on growing, expanding in our faith. And number four, we never stop having fun because nobody wants to be drawn to a group of Christians that are just sour with having no fun, right? We're going to have a good time. That's why we eat here so much, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's fun to eat. So, yeah, I'm going to close in prayer, and then we're going to do just that. So feel free to hang out and enjoy um, a meal. And like I said, around 1.30, 1.45, we're going to be wrapping things up. So, Father, we thank you so much that you have called us to be children, to have childlike faith. And so I pray that all the, all the good things we think about, about children, that they would be true of us when it comes to our walk with you, that we would look at you and say, Daddy, you can do anything. Nothing is impossible with you. And Jesus, we would, we would walk with you and align ourselves with you who said that you came to serve. And so we take that place of humility. Jesus, and just as you, the Bible says that you grew in strength, that you grew in wisdom. And so, Lord, how can we think that we could never be done growing in wisdom and knowledge and strength and grace? And, and Father, help us to be a group of people that are just fun to be around. Um, Jesus, you were funny. I believe it. And so, Father, help us to be people that are filled with laughter, filled with joy, um, filled with uh, just an, an open honesty that people are attracted to the Jesus they see in each one of us. Lord, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.